2 Timothy chapter 3, I just listening to the testimonies. I didn't necessarily come to preach this, but I didn't necessarily not come to preach it either. I want to mind the Holy Ghost. Um, this is what your Bible said. It said, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, and men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient earth, unthankful, unholy, natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. You're much of a Bible student. You've read these verses before. And man, if there's, I think about Judges 21, 25, if there's a Old Testament verse that describes the day in which we live, Judges 21, 25 is that verse. It said there was no king in Israel. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. This world says, do whatever feels good. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what you do, who you hurt, just do whatever feels good. Whatever feels right to you, just do it. And that's the hour in which we live. But if you are looking for a New Testament verse to describe the hour that we're living in, it's these verses that we've looked at tonight. This know also that in life these perilous, dangerous, wicked times are come. And he said, for men shall be loved their own self. But he begins to list the characteristics of the days when it's going to be before the Lord comes. And you better believe we're living in those verses. I can look at these verses easily. I can look at verse 3 and I can preach upon the callous folks. The callous ones where it says, without natural vexes, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good. We're living in a day where we call bad good and good bad. Amen. It's a, we're living in an America that thinks that the believer, a child of God, is the problem. It's not the drunkards. It's not the liquor crowd. It's not the dope crowd. And it's not the liberals. It's the one that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the problem in America. That's what if you were to ask them, that's what they'd tell you. It's not the abortion crowd. Amen. It's not Budweiser. It's not Jack Daniels. It, it, it's Christians. They despise their good. Amen. I mean, have mercy. Some of the things we've seen go on in the streets of America in the last three or four years. It's unreal that I never thought that I'd see that in a day. I'm without natural affection. I never thought I'd see days where men and women didn't know which bathroom to go in. Hello? And if that's not enough, we got kids that are in schools that are they, they, they're acting like cats. Using litter boxes instead of a restroom. You, you, we're mixed up. And I can preach on that. And be honest with you, Brother Doug, I can preach that in pulpits and, and churches that we preach in, and they would shout me down. I can go into verse number three and four and preach on the carnal. I can preach on carnality and everything that we see. I, I agree with the preacher. I think a lot of reasons we can't have revival in our day is because what is in our pocket. Right. We spend my, we're we driven by what we see, and these kids are driven by social media, and half of what they see is on there is not real. Right. Right. It's not real. Uh, it amazes me, these ladies, they, or they'll post this house, and it's got white carpet and white furniture, and every pillow's in place, nothing in the floor. I'm thinking either you don't have children or you've got a maid. Amen. Because that's not reality. Amen. I can preach on carn carnality. It's killing our churches. It's killing our church. We, we've, got, uh, we've got a generation of young preachers that are uh, traveling across the land apologizing for their raising. Well, because a preacher preached against sin or preached about some personal holiness or separation from the world, they call that abuse. I call that Bible preaching. We're living in a day where we've got a generation of young men that are preaching our pulpits. 
time telling our folks it's okay to be like the world than they are edifying them to be like Christ. Yeah, right. Amen. Amen. I can preach about the carnal. Look at verse 5. Having the form of God is to deny the power thereof from such turn away. I can preach on the contemporary. Amen. I'm a, if there's anything that amazes me in the hour, it's the lack of discernment that we have. And I believe the lack of discernment is the lack of being filled with the Holy Ghost because you're filled with the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is going to help you discern the Scripture and discern a service. Amen. But can I say to you tonight, it's not the, it, it, it's not the callous crowd that affects our service tonight. And it's not the carnal crowd that affects our normal church services. And it's not the contemporary. This, you've got a pastor. It ain't contemporary out here. It ain't, even, it ain't even we're leaning that way or looking that way. Y'all thank God for a shepherd that steered you away from that mess. Amen. If that's all, if that's all that church was, it sounded like the world, they act like the world, they look like the world, and they act like the world. Somebody tell me why we need to get saved. Amen. But the contemporaries are not affecting our service tonight. Look at verse 2. I believe there is one word in there that jumps out at me that I do believe affects our normal services in good churches. Saved people on their way to heaven. Their name's written in the book of life. They're trying to live for God. You say, which one is it? It's that next to last word. Unthankful. Uh, unthankful. Anybody want to brag? As preacher said, anybody want to brag on the Lord? And man, that's a blessing. We we had more than the norm in places I go that would stand up and say, thank "The Lord, I got saved. I got saved." I want to thank the God for the helping me in surgery. I want to help to thank the Lord that I want to thank God for what's real. Amen. But can I help you here? About about a third. About a third. It ought to be where he has to about put seat belts yeah, in these pews yeah. to keep us in our seat because we are so thankful to what the Lord has done. Amen. Yeah. I'm telling you, friend, we, you say, what is, the, what is the enemy of thankfulness? Pride. You know what pride says? Pride says, I, I deserve that. I deserve that. Lord, you should bless me. Do you see how do you see how I dress? You see what I talk about? Do you see how many tracts I gave out this week? Do you see I'm trying to sing in the choir, teach a Sunday school class, run a bus, support missionaries? Lord, I deserve that blessing. No, you've just traded your you've just traded your worldly pride in for religious pride. Amen. Pride says, I deserve. Gratitude says, I'm unworthy. Pride says, I deserve this. But gratitude said, I don't deserve. I don't deserve. If we're ever going to have revival in our churches, we're going to have to have a revival of gratitude. Amen. You say, Brother Micah Henson wrote some years ago, if God never blesses me again, he's done enough that I can shout to an end. Amen. Somewhere along the way, we're going to have to get to the place uh, where we're not, listen, just serving God for the blessings, uh, but we're serving God for the blesser. Amen. Uh, I'd rather have the blesser than the blessing uh, because the blessing may run out, the blessing may expire, or the creek may dry. The river may run dry but as long as I've got the blesser praise God. If you want a loaf of bread you just keep the loaf of bread I'll take the baker friend because as long as I got the baker there'll be bread in my house. Amen. Turn your Bible to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Look at verse, at verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, 
for he blessed me. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he answered my prayer. Oh, give thanks to the Lord because my bills are paid. Oh, give thanks to the Lord because all my problems are solved. All my burdens are lifted. All my disappointments have been fixed. All my ailments have been healed. Or to just say, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he's good. When you woke up this morning, he was good. And when the sun went down, he's good. And when you lay your head on your pillow, he'll be good. And when you get up in the morning, he'll be good because he's good by nature. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. I like that verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for its goodness and its wonderful works to the children of men. Let's have a little, have a little hermeneutics class. How many times does the Bible have to say something for it to be the Bible? How many times? Give me a man. A, you get an A. Tell them real loud. How many times? One times. So are we in agreement that if the Bible says, how many John 3, 16's are they? One. How many Romans 5, 8's are they? One. Amen. How many Ephesians 2, 8's are they? One. How many Romans 3, 23's are they? One. Amen. How many Romans 10, 13's are they? One. How many John 14, 1 through 4 are they? One. And we claim that. That's being the truth of the word of God. Yeah. Do we not? Yeah. How many times? One. Somebody tell me what verse 15 said. What did it say? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Twice in 15 verses, he says, oh, that men... Did you realize you were doing what the Lord commanded you to do? Just a minute ago when you said, I want to thank God for what's real. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. He is real. Amen. Amen. So if he, one, makes it the word of God, I wonder what it makes it when he says it twice in 15 verses. Somebody tell me what verse 21 says. What's verse 21 say? Oh, that men. I've, I've been preaching through the Psalms at church, and I hadn't done it the last, probably the last five or six years because I'm hardly ever home on a Wednesday night. But for many, many years, I preached through the book of Psalms. I think I got somewhere around Psalm 121 before really my meeting started to carry me away a lot on Wednesday night. You know the deepest word of emotion in the Psalm. It's the shortest word. Oh. The writers tell me when you read that word, oh, in the book of Psalms, it's like you're moved and moved from the depths of your spirit and the depths of your soul. It's almost like you would say, oh, oh, that men would, oh. It's just like it's a groan up from the deepest recesses of your heart and your spirit that you're praising him up from the deepest part of your being. I'm asking you, how long has it been since God just filled you so deep and filled you so full that all you could do was reach into the depths of the well of your soul and your spirit and lift your hands and lift your voice and say, Lord, I want to bless your name for your goodness. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. So we're looking at three times in 21 verses. Somebody tell me what verse 31 says. Does it say, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, wonderful works to the children of men? How many times makes it the word of God? One time? And for him to say it four times in 31 verses, four times 
in one chapter. And then add, oh, give thanks to the Lord for his good and for his mercy endureth forever. I mean, there's five commands in one chapter that we ought to give God glory and thanksgiving. So what's our excuse? Did not the pastor say just a moment ago, anybody got a word? Anybody want to brag on him? And we probably had 10, 10. So is our lack of giving him glory our testimony that he's not good? Amen. You say, preacher, why? I, I, you think I'll stand? Listen, there ought to be something in us that the Holy Ghost. Oh, you said just been go do it flips. There ought to be something in us. Amen. God help us. I remember walking on a football field on Friday nights and the lights would be on and those guys over there playing those quads. I mean, man, it was something about that. It just, I remember even as a 50-year-old man tonight, I can remember walking out on a football field at 18 years old and there was just something about hearing that that put me in the mood uh, to try to knock somebody's chin strap loose uh, and the rivets out. Listen, when I get to hear it, uh, somebody sing about breaking an alabaster box or I know great orphan. Uh, Jesus has rescued me. Uh, oh, friend, there's something in me uh, uh, that begins to want to stand up in the gable, into my soul, uh, and say, Lord, you've been good to me. Uh, I should be in hell. Uh, I should still be lost. Uh, I should still be under the condemnation of God. Uh, but you came to where I was, uh, and you lifted me out and just set my feet on a solid rock and establish my going and put a new song in my heart. I've teased our folks at church. How many, how many of you fellas got a, a steel or a Husqvarna blower, weed eater? Any of y'all got one of them? I mean, I know we're in the city. I live on a farm. I don't have one blower, I have three blowers. You say one, why? Because I have two sons and me. And if I'm gonna be doing it, they can do it. I got three weed eaters. Why? Because I'm 50 years old and the ground's a long way away. I need some help. You say you got one? What do you do before you crank it? You just walk out there and pull it? All these guys putting that on there, you know, where you pull the thing out and just let it go and it cranks. They're a bunch of liars. They don't do that. You can tell they ain't never weed eating none. I, I told our ushers we're going to get a new ushering ministry. We're going to have we're going to have them little bubbles implanted on people's necks. And when they come to church, I'm going to have the ushers hit them about five times. You really want him to do that because that way you ain't done with the choir singing before somebody grunts. You want him to say, turn in your hymnal to page 139 and somebody ought to say, hey man, I know that when I heard somebody say, oh, when the song began to play, just a minute ago, that's going to be a good one. I mean, listen, there ought to be something in us. I mean, years ago, our grandparents uh, and our forefathers would get in a thicket somewhere or go before the, how uh, they ever came to the grounds of the house of God and they would pray and they would get in touch with the Lord and they came ready to worship they came primed to meet with God what's our excuse amen preacher just stand back there one two three four and some of it's a hard leak you might need about ten pops Some of them need to be jerked a little harder, amen. <laughs> Why should we praise God? It's in the text. Look at your Bible. It's in the text. The Bible said this. He got, verse 3, he gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. 
hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord. Boy, I like that. It didn't say after their trouble, after it was fixed. It didn't say after the blessing it came. It said then, he said they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. You say, preacher, why should I praise God tonight? Uh, notice what your Bible said. Uh, he said, verse nine, for he satisfied the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Uh, uh, can I tell you why we ought to praise God tonight? Uh, uh, because he fills the faint man. Amen. Uh, uh, what you were saying just a minute ago, uh, there's times in the work of God, your heart gets weary. I mean, there's folks that don't act saved. They act mean. They act lost. And they hurt you, and you see disappointment and burdens come. And you can just certainly listen. The only way you get weary is not on a bar stool, uh, not in the bed of a strange woman or a strange man, uh, not just with a needle in your arm, uh, but you can get weary serving Christ uh, and doing the right things uh, and living separated, singing in the choir, involved in Sunday school. Uh, but the battle will weary you. Uh, but every once in a while, God. Uh, will send a service. He'll send a song. He'll send a special meeting. And what does he do? He feels the faint man. He said hungry and thirsty of their soul faint in the I wonder if I could have watched you walk in spiritually tonight. Uh, uh, did you stagger to your seat? Uh, uh, were you weak? Are you dehydrated? Uh, are you faint in the work of God? Uh, uh, but I've got good news tonight. Uh, on December the 6th, uh, uh, God still fills the faint man. Uh, he's got fresh bread. Uh, he's got a well full of water. Uh, I'm telling you, neighbor, he fills the faint man. Are you weary? weary. Sometimes you just get tired. You know what? We get weary. I think this is my 44th week this year. One of those weeks I've had two meetings in them. Some of them have three in them. Come January, come December, I've got road rash because my backside's dragging. I, I tell you, Monday night, I got in the car and I drove to Chesney, South Carolina about two and a half hours. The last hour and 40 minutes of my trip, I've got a husband and wife in our church. It seems like it's coming apart at the seams. For an hour and 45 minutes, I talked to the daughter. I talked to the daddy. Pulled up in the, pulled up in the per church parking lot. Got off the phone at 648. Been talking about that problem and that struggle for an hour and 45 minutes at 648. I had to go in and put my shirt on, put my tie on. Brother Adam Borden was there. Y'all remember Brother Borden from camp? He was there and his girls were singing. And man, he'd come in, he'd come be, and he was encouraged. He was excited to see him, and I was excited to see him. He was excited to see me. He said, Preacher, how's your day been? I said, Brother Adam, let me tell you something. I said, I've been living the first verse of one of Kyle Rowland's songs. Where it said, Satan has been so near to me today, trying to hinder in every way. Amen. But I've had enough. So I told Satan, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to my father and see if I can pray. And I was poor mouthed, but I told brother that. I said, that's what it's been the last hour and 45 minutes. I said, but in 10 minutes, it's going to be church time. And there's a church full of folks out there oh, that want somebody to stand up and open a Bible with a touch of God and some fresh bread burning in their soul. I said, I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Oh, yeah. Last night, I got in the car, went home, went back to Hartsville, South Carolina, and I drove four hours to church. The last two hours... I was talking with the son and the daughter and the daddy again for two hours. Got out of the, park, got out of the car at 6.50, hung the phone up. Ten minutes later, church starts. God helps me. Yeah. 
When I get down, preacher, you know how it is. I sat down with my phone. There's four messages and four missed calls. Please call me as soon as you get out of church. Before I ever pull the front tires off that gravel parking lot and put it on that country road on the backside of Hartsville, South Carolina, I was on the phone with that family. And for three of the four hours home, it was on. And I'm not talking about glory. I'm talking about burdens and weeping and hollering. I wouldn't tell you who that is for nothing in the world. And I got home. Mama stayed up. She could tell I was upset. 2.15 came this morning. 2.30 we laid down. 6.45 we're back up. The lack of sleep is not the problem. It's that I'm hurting for my people. Amen. Amen. And I'm not drunk. I'm not an addict. Hello, are you okay? I'm not sleeping around on my wife. I'm not cheating on my wife. Amen. Are you listening? But you get weary in the battle. You get weary in the battle. But boy, the last two nights I walked in there defeated, my heart hungry and thirsty. But all of a sudden, I come help me preach. Come stand up here. Come stand up here like you're preaching. I mean, you walk up here and you're thinking, oh, God, I need you. I mean, he stood there before. I mean, you open your Bible and you're thinking you need a touch from God. I mean, you've been battling and in the way and all of a sudden some from another world just slips up behind you and puts his arms around you and puts his hand on you and stirs your heart and moves you. I'm telling you friend the reason we ought to praise the Lord uh, for his goodness uh, most of us have been saved a while and it, had it not been for the fact uh, of that he feels the faint man uh, and then he'll fill you with a drink of fresh water uh, and a bite of fresh bread uh, oh, we'd have never made it this far you're here because he didn't quit and you're here because she didn't quit and we're here because they didn't quit I say praise God we ought to give him glory because he feels the faint man Amen. Amen. Amen some line comes to my I'm terrible I can't remember songs anymore I remember lines but I can hear somebody say are you weary from the struggle you're facing, I don't even know the rest of the song. Thank you, preacher. Are you weary tonight? Are you weary? Are you weary? Is that why you can't praise him, you're weary? I mean, I, I remember days playing ball. And two a days in August, we'd crawl to the water fountain. I mean, man, I'm talking about 98 degrees. There was no heat index. You practice from 8 to 12 in the morning and 3.30 to 7 in the evening. Amen. 98 degrees, raining, hot. You say, what did you do when you thought you was going to die? You crawled over and got water out of a metal pipe that was rusted in the mud. Amen. It was no bottle. It was not Propel. It was not Gatorade. It was rust-colored water. Amen. You say, was it worth it? You better believe when I finally got over there, I might have had to crawl 15 yards, but when I finally got there, I didn't even have to drink it. I just lay in it. Amen. Are you that way tonight? I've got good news. He said in verse 9, he satisfied the longing of the soul. He filleth, hey, are you weary tonight? Amen. He said, praise him because he feels the faint man. Notice your Bible. Verse 10, such as sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Because they rebelled against the words of God. Notice verse 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands asunder. Come help me. He said, what did he say in verse 10? He said they're bound in affliction and iron. I could tie you up here. I 
How long have you been coming to church like that? Let me just say this to you. If the devil has any ground according to Ephesians in your life, it's not because he, he, he has no authority to take it. Before you were saved, you were a child of hell. You were a child of the devil. But when you got saved, you become a child of God. You know why I don't whip your kids and why you don't whip my kids? They're not our kids. You whip yours and I whip mine. Hello? Everybody okay? I lost my button. Y'all pray for me. The devil has no authority in your life. If he has ground in your life, it's because you gave it to him. Amen. Amen. How long has it been since you've been bound? You come in and watch preacher preach, sweat drop off of him, tonsils will stick out, red face turns red, lips turn purple. You see the fire sing. You hear somebody else worship. You hear somebody else praise God. You hear somebody shout. You see somebody pray. But when you want to put your hands up, you try to put your hands up and you try to praise God, but something just keeps binding you and pulling you back down. You know what? You ought to praise God. He doesn't just feel the faint man, but he frees the fettered man. I'm telling you the same God that pulled Pulled you out of hell, forgave you of your sin, made you a child of God, translated you of darkness into life, or can break the bands that have you bound wherever you are in your Christian life. If nothing happened this week other than the Lord coming to where you are and breaking the bands asunder, where you could put your hands up. And give him glory again. Take the shackles off your feet. I preached it in a jail one time at home some years ago. Back, back then, they didn't let us go back in the pods. They would bring them out to a little building. They'd bring an entire pod out to a little room. And they would come in there. they shackled at their feet with another man. And they were shackled at their hands with another man. I remember one morning I gave an invitation. Convicted God came and sat out in that place. And everybody in the place came to the altar. Some voluntary and some involuntary. Some came because they wanted to and others came because they were chained to somebody that wanted to. Amen. Wouldn't it be something in this December meeting? What is it, youngin? Is it something you've seen? Is it somebody, what somebody said? Is it your own failure? Is it somebody that you look to, their disappointment, their failure? What is it that's bound you? We sing, once like a bird in prison I dwelt. No freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came and listened to me. Glory to God, he set me free. How long has it been since you sang in the youth choir with any freedom? How long has it been since you sang in the adult choir with any freedom? Was the last time you prayed and you didn't feel like you were bound? Some of us are sitting here and know what it feels like to be bound. But we also know what it feels like when he sets you free. Are you listening to me? Man, my little wife, she's five foot two. She's redheaded, and that red hair means everything you think it does. <laughs> High blood pressure. Our folks better be glad she's not the pastor. <laughs> It'd be rough. It'd be blood and guts everywhere. Can I get a witness? There would be no coddling. Amen. I mean, us men, we get sick. We want somebody to coddle us a little bit. She just tells me to suck it up. Let's go. Amen. 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 I mean, listen to me. I met I, that little one. Listen, if if she if she if I hold, if I held her, she would absolutely lose her mind. If I if I she can't stand to be held. I mean, we'd play around when we were younger, married, and I had no sense, and you know we'd wrestle around and and play around. And I'd get her to hold her and just hold her just for meanness because I could not hurt her, just held her. That was not a smart thing. <laughs> Can I get a witness with you men? Your wife does not fight fair. They find little places like the inside of your arm. And honey, they could lead a 2,000 pound bull around the square of your town the way they get a hold of him. Right, look, I got him right there. He's feeling something right there. Amen. <laughs> Are you listening? She can't stand it. 
We can, you, you would want somebody holding you. But why are we satisfied to come to church bound? We're bound in our bitterness. We're bound in our unforgiveness. We're bound in our deadness. We're bound in our coldness. But we're satisfied. Notice your Bible. Why should we praise the Lord? He fills the faint man. He frees the fettered man. Then look at verse 17. Fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of me. They draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and delivered them and delivered them out of their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. He doesn't just feel the faint man. He doesn't just free the fettered man. He fashions the foolish man. How many of you old timers remember what Flip Wilson used to say? The devil made me do it. We give him a whole lot more credit than he's due. Most of our messes are self-inflicted. They're self-inflicted. Fools because of their transgression. Fools because of their transgression. But what about God when we mess it up? And we mess it up of our own will and our own bad choices and our own volition. He said, he sends his word and heals them and delivers them out of their destruction. I'm glad there's no potter's field for a New Testament believer. One of the most blessed songs from years ago, mom and dad, I remember, they used to sing, he didn't, I bless the day he didn't throw the clay away. You know why some of us ought to praise God? It's because he's long-suffering. And when he could have thrown us away, he didn't. Number four, and I'm done. You helping me preach, ain't you? Amen. You're mad at me because I did misidentified your mama in the summer meeting <laughs> with the wrong brother. I was just praising God I got to church tonight with no blue lights on. It was a real blessing. I, I was like, I hope he's at church and not working because he'll play a joke on me and stop me somewhere. Amen. I've been asking forgiveness for that for months, okay? All right? You still mad at me. I got babies at church, the only time they let me hold them is while I'm preaching. And do they like it? They get to, every, when I get, get to going, they'll get to going. Amen. And babies like preaching. I'm done right here. Notice the Bible. Verse 25, for commandeth raise up stormy wind which lifteth the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. They cry unto the Lord in their trouble. Every one of these people are crying to the Lord in their trouble. But then he said, he maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. You know why we ought to praise God tonight? Not just because he feels the faint man. Not just because he frees the fettered man. Not just because he fashions the foolish man. But because he finds the fallen man. Staggers like a drunk man at wit's end. You ever got there? I was my wit's end this morning about 1245. I'd said all I could say. I'd counseled all I could counsel. And I looked at him and I said, when you get ready to act different, this can change. I said, when you quit trying to fix the other one and start fixing yourselves, this can change. You said you hang up defeated? No. I was frustrated. But I still know that when you're at wit's end, he can make the waves thereof still and calm. I don't know what your burden is tonight. I lay down last night. One of the reasons I couldn't go to sleep, but you know what I'm talking about. You lay down, and it's like your body's wore out and you're emotionally spent, but your mind's running a marathon. What should I have said different? What could I have done? What are you saying about? Some of us ought to praise God because we know what it is to be weary, but we know what it is to be filled. Some of us ought to praise God because we know what it is to be bound, 
but we know what it is to be free. Some of us ought to thank God because we know what it is to be foolish, but we know what it is to be fashioned. And we know what it is to be fallen, but we know what it is to be found. I wonder how different church could be tomorrow night. I wonder how, 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 how much church would be different tomorrow night. We get weary like you were talking. I appreciate, man, what you said. God, God started stirring in my heart. I appreciate you minding the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you something? When you come to church, your motto ought to be what the Lord, what Mary told the disciples, whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. If we'll be obedient in a church, we'll have Holy Ghost church. Amen. But see, what happens when, when those, 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 those distractions and those things you were talking about, they come in our life, that's reality right there. I appreciate your honesty. What happens is he gets our mind on all that that's wrong. And there's about three of them things that are wrong. And there's about 97 other things over here that are right. And we can't see the 97 things that are right. But those three things that are clamoring, that clamor for our attention and pierce our soul and pierce our spirit. And then all of a sudden we can't praise God no more because we're thinking, man, my, my daddy give his life like that and somebody talk like that. You get to thinking about those times where he's filled you yes. and he's freed you yes. and he's fashioned you yes. and he's, fa man, they get to be a dim, yes. a dim faint memory right. and he gets to be real large. Come back to the piano, son. I wonder tonight, are, are you weary? See, we're, what happens is our pride, you know, that pride that says we deserve, that pride says, man, I'm a better Christian to get weary. No, you're a liar. You're a liar. I mean, the greatest Christians I know, I'm talking, I, I, I've got an 89-year-old deacon. Y'all may, I've had him pray, tall, slender man, bald-headed, and I've had him pray before lots of, some, at least one night of a team meeting about every year. I'll call Brother Brady up. I'm talking about if I've ever met a Christian. Roger Brady is a Christian. I, I, not a preacher. He's a Christian. Not a singer. He's a Christian. And his little wife been married 70 years. Over 70 years. She's had to put her in a home. He can't take care of her. And he sits right over here. He sits where you sit in our church. We got two, two pews. He sits right there. And he went to check on him one Sunday morning. Sister Foster and I, he sat down by himself, big tears running down his face. And I walked over to him. I said, RV? I said, what is it, brother? He said, preacher, I'm talking about one of the greatest Christian men I've ever known. He told me, he said, preacher, I'm a broken man. I'm a broken man. I'm talking about if I've ever seen a Christian. He said, I'm a broken man. My little bride's up there. And she's sick, preacher, and I can't, I can't fix it. You know what he was? He was weary. But just this last Sunday, he stood over there, big tears dripping down his face with hands in the air, worshiping God and testifying with glory in his soul. You say, what happened? God filled the faint man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. You say, what are you looking for, that couple? I'm looking for God to break the bands asunder. Those bands of unforgiveness, those bands of distrust, those bands of, of a lack of forbearing, those bands of, of bitterness. You think really God can really do that? You better believe I do. I've seen it. What you need to come thank Him for? Maybe what do you need to admit? I'm weary, I'm, I'm bound. Or maybe you just ought to thank God that you are not bound. And right now you're not weary. And you're not weary because of faith. How many times he makes it the Bible? Once. So if he were to say it four times in 31, you know, that, that's how wives get our attention. They repeat things. 
Amy does not believe I can watch ESPN and listen to her at the same time, but I can. I can be hollering touchdown bulldogs and know exactly what she's saying. And then holler at Alabama all at the same time. A teacher will tell you the best way to instruct a child is repetition. And if one time is the Bible, four times in 31 verses must mean it's pretty important. What do you need to do tonight? Some of us ought to come ask the Lord to forgive us that we've been unthankful. Some of you kids, you battling your mom and dad, you fuss because they say no to this and no to that. You ought to thank God you got a parent that cares. Some of you, some of you need to thank the father you can see. Because if you can't thank the father you can see, you'll never convince me you'll thank the heavenly father you've never seen. I know being a preacher's child ain't easy, but it's better than being a drunkard's child. It's better than being a wife beater's child. It's better than being an addict's child. I know you grow up right in Carter and you, the you brother, you grow up in a fishbowl and everybody wants grace for their children but none for the preacher's kids. They're supposed to be perfect. But they're not. You know why my children aren't perfect? They're being raised by an imperfect daddy. Amen. Amen. Well, you need to come praise him for. I believe if we really got a hold of it, church would be different tomorrow night. When she got to singing about alabaster box, somebody be bringing something. You'd be bringing something and saying, man, I'm Stand. We're not going to sing 17,000 verses. The invitation's been given. What do you need to come? What do you need to come? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. It would change Wahoo Baptist Church. It'll change Emmanuel Baptist Church. It'll change any Baptist church. We get back to the idea where we realize. God, help us not to be unthankful because, Lord, you've been real good. Lord, you filled me when I was faint. You freed me when I was fettered. You fashioned me when I was foolish. You found me when I was fallen. I certainly don't want to be unthankful. Brother Buster Seaton said years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago, he was preaching on the on the one that went back to the Lord, that one leper, the only one that went back. And this is what he said. He said, I'd rather say thank you and not mean it than to mean it and not say it. I'd rather say thank you and not mean it than to mean it and not say it. Look here. I've got a 23-year-old and one that'll be 21 years old next week. You know what? It still means something to me. And they know when they go with me. They know I'm going to buy their supper. And one of them's married. It don't get deeper. You just start buying more people's. I looked at my credit card the other day and my youngest one had gone out to church with, after church at the Mexican restaurant. And I thought, man, he was hungry. It was $90 at the Mexican restaurant. I thought, chips and salts and water are free. I said, Carter, were you hungry? He said, Daddy. He said, a bunch of the boys went out with me from the church. and He said, I knew you'd, you, if you was there, you'd have bought their supper, so I, I just did. I said, but I wasn't there. Do you know what means something to me, Brother Dre? You know what means something to me? Is when my 23-year-old gets up knowing that I've been buying his supper for 23 years, he gets up and this, he says this, thank you for supper, Daddy. Thank you for supper, Daddy. You know what means something to your wife, sir? She might have been cooking you supper for 40 years, but when you get up at supper and you say, Mama, thank you for supper. I oh, bless God, that's her job. See how long that gets you. That'll get you some Cheerios tomorrow night. But you get up and say, baby, that was, that was a blessing. Thank you. You might get some biscuits and sausage gravy tomorrow night. 
glory to God. Say thank you. You know, you know what we are? There's some thanksgiving that ought to go on this way. Where you thank people that you've served God with, that have testified and been faithful, and ones that didn't quit, they've just stayed in. So I'm thankful let's go this way. Thank you, preacher, for praying hell off my family. Thank you for being patient when I was cold. Thank you for being patient when I was just drifting and, 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 and not doing anything for God. But you stayed with me. Thank you. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.